I don't think I mentioned it the last time, but this is actually the grand finale of season one of Architecture of Center. I wanted to thank everyone for listening and bearing with me while I got a hang of podcasting. Season two is already in the pipeline, and I can't wait to put it out in the world. Oh, and another big update. I mentioned the Architecture of Center website in the trailer episode, but it took me 10 episodes to actually put it together. So have a look at arcofcenter.com. That is A-R-C-H-O-F-F-C-E-N-T-R-E dot com. And let me know what you think about it. And if you have any ideas for upcoming episodes or just want to say hi, I would love to hear from you. Now on to today's episode. Have you ever seen a storefront opening up as a theater? Or a dilapidated house becoming a community event space? Or ever dined on an unfolding table that serves food from plants on the verge of extinction? What about a lamppost that is lit by converting dog poop into electricity? Well, if you know any of these projects, you're probably familiar with Matthew Mazzotta's work. Today's episode is a special one because it is with my boss, my friend, and my collaborator, Matthew Mazzotta. Matthew is an internationally renowned artist who works at the intersection of public art, activism, and urbanism, particularly focusing on creating spectacular public spaces with communities while highlighting the social, economic, and environmental issues. Matthew is a graduate of MIT and is a Guggenheim Fellow, a Loeb Fellow at Harvard, and also a TED Fellow. His work has received several accolades, including Design's Architecture Project of the Year Award, and most recently, his TED Talk went live. So let's get started. My name is Vaishnavi Shukla, and this is Architecture of Center, a podcast where we highlight unconventional design practices and research projects that reflect the emerging discourses within the design discipline and beyond. Architecture of Center features conversations with some exceptionally creative individuals who have extrapolated the traditional fields of architecture, planning, landscape, and urban design. Okay, oh, I'm good. Okay, so I think our conversation today might seem a little too familiar or a little too casual to people listening, and that's okay for me because we worked together for almost two years now. And I kind of feel guilty knowing way too much about you and the practice than any interviewer should. So I thought, why not just ask you about stuff that I've always been curious about and really don't know about your work or your previous project, the stuff that's not out there in the public domain. Does that sound okay? Yep. Beautiful. That's actually, I was wondering how we were going to do this since uh, <laughs> you know all the tricks and all the thoughts, but um, <laughs> if, if we can go someplace else, it'd be interesting. Yeah, usually I'd like send a few just topics or questions and, you know, because nobody till now was as experienced as you were, I, I thought with you would just kind of, I mean, I have the questions, but I didn't want to <laughs> send them to you. So I'm cheating a little bit, but nevertheless, I thought we could begin with maybe your very first public art project. W what was that like? Was it bicycle? Was it pear shear? Or should we really way back to your time at MIT? My first public artwork might have been what, like, like probably many people in a small town, um, a can of spray paint. So in this little town uh, I grew up in, you know, there's not a lot. There's like a five or 6,000 people. We had our little shopping centers or whatever. I, I would go behind them and there'd be walls. And this is like pre graffiti hitting you know the world it was in our little town it was hard to you know you might see it in a movie or whatever but then i was like okay i'm doing it anyways and so there was no scene here or anything and i would just kind of you know do my own thing and um at the time they were like little missions because it is it's kind of like i don't know how people think about it an act of vandalism i'm sure someone's not going to like it but i did it in areas where um you know, only I would see or, you know, very few people might go behind, you know, be behind a building and through the woods kind of thing. 
And yeah, I just got obsessed with it. I started like doing these pieces, sketching them out, and then, you know, putting them together. And yeah, very few people saw them, but uh, that was my first act. And I remember thinking, getting very excited that like those lived in the world and this chance encounter that someone might come across them or whatever. So yeah, I think the very simplest public art for me was probably just the spray paint can and a wall. When you say it was at a place where nobody else could see you or, you know, they would be kind of hidden. Can you can you give us some examples? Like, where would it be, for example? I, I mean, I haven't spoken about this before or to anybody f- for a long time. But yeah, behind like a like a big box store, if you can imagine mm. you know, something made out of cinder blocks, you would go behind it. It might be a part of a loading dock where a truck might come in and unload the goods so that they could sell it up front. Um, and I'm just realizing now that when I um, I did those, uh, you know, graffiti pieces, then I got interested in the beatniks and uh, I started, I just started getting obsessed with all the different writers. And so, and I liked the fact that they were kind of a group, at least they were kind of formalized as a group um, historically. Um, mm. They all hung out. I would cut out um, pieces of their poems I'd like um, and, and Xerox them, copy them. And then I would go around when I went to Chicago, that's where I went to art school, I would actually, again, find these alleyways, and I would, you know, wheat paste them to the walls. And it, was, it wasn't very public, but it was just this chance encounter that someone that wasn't me, or in my network, would see this. And then I actually went all over Chicago, and I was like hopping fences and putting them in weird spots, just so that like, you know, it really was... How the hell did this get here for someone that might see it? And then I actually made these little, I was into making zines, like little magazines, huh. you know, with personal thoughts, or whatever. But I made one all about this network that I had made of where they were in Chicago. And I had little descriptions so you could find them all. And then I would leave this little pamphlet on the subway. So, I mean, it was definitely like not reaching a large audience. But it was just this idea that someone might happen upon this and then be able to go down the that rabbit hole that I was going through, which was trying to match a poem with a certain location, um, like of an alley or a viewpoint or whatever, just I was trying to complement each other. But yeah, not a large audience at all. But that was my first endeavor out into the public. I had absolutely no idea. This is so cool. So I don't know if like this podcast had ever at any point makes it big and there's somebody from Christie's or Sotheby's and they go to Canton, New York (laughs) and go to the loading docks of the big box store. They can probably, you know, take it off the wall and maybe auction it as the very first original Matthew Mazzotta, something that we're completely against is, you know, having that kind of work that (laughs) can ever be possessed by someone. This is, I had absolutely no idea. This is so cool. Yeah, I I think all that stuff came out of I was attracted to um, skateboarding and um, skateboarding was always in the public space. So you're, you take the skateboard and you start rolling around this little town and you start to reinterpret the architecture. This is a bench, but we can, you know, grind or slide it or jump over it or whatever we may do. Or a, yeah, a loading dock was obviously great. It's concrete and it's got, you know, the difference of height or whatever, but just being outside. I remember that was, I looked at back at that, of my life when I was in high school, you know, you get done with school and then you're immediately outside until whenever, late at night. And then when the summer hit, I mean, we just lived outside. Just every single second was outside. And so you're always exploring new spaces to have a session with your friends, skateboarding. And then um, once the skateboard mags, magazines came, you know, you'd see graffiti in those. You'd see a bunch of stuff that was cultural from the city and I just remember trying to like take my hand to it and uh still being in this small little town with the resources I had just to flex it and see what we could do here and um I think that's how it all started is um knowing that there was ways to express yourself I don't know if it was really appreciated in this small town especially in the form I was giving it at the moment but um just trying it you know just dipping the toe in the water of like what is this all about your method and your mode of expression has changed and evolved over the years. But I now hearing where it all began from, I think the one thread that still continues is 
is the common thread of having chance encounters, right? I mean, even when you look at open house or when you're, you know, looking at the storefront theater or even harm to table, you're trying to create these situations where people can have these these chance encounters that they probably otherwise wouldn't have, like these very intentional chance encounters. But when I was looking through your initial projects, um, you know, whether it's Wandering Home or Do Not Disturb, which is a group of placemats aimed at provoking conversations about heritage in Italy or looking for landscaped and steeped in exploration, these initial projects, while in the public domain, focused more on quite literally like the phenomenon on gathering, right? They're kind of fun and cheerful and chirpy, very celebratory in nature. Not that the other projects are not, but the latter projects, including the storefront theater, open house, harm to table, and even neighbors that we're all working on right now, are very rooted in their intention and cause. This is where I see you not just as an artist, but also an activist, whether it is highlighting the phenomenon of abandoned main streets in rural America or talking about climate change, you know, very broadly. Do you know yourself or do you know that moment when this shift happened for you? Was it like a conscious choice or was it just the kind of opportunities that were coming along your way that needed you to shift into a different pair of shoes? Or I wouldn't say different pair of shoes, but kind of take on another role in addition to being an artist <clears throat> yeah let's see if we can answer this um because i have a couple thoughts about it um you always self-analyze but um growing up in a small town yeah there's um i didn't excel at much and it almost seemed like a finite world this is what this little town has and this is your opportunities but as soon as i saw this little crack in the wall i think uh, an art professor showed you know, Andy Warhol's warehouse. And I saw, you know, the Velvet Underground playing music in a tinfoil room where they're videotaping each other, uh, you know, while they're sleeping. And I was just like, wow, this is really wild. Like all these adults are just using all this equipment in this really unique way. And I remember going, okay, so there's other ways to do things. And I was immediately attracted to that. Then the whole idea of skateboarding came and um, it was right in the early 90s, I guess. And that's where, um, if you followed skateboarding at all, it, now it's a huge industry, but at that time it was just passing over from one generation of skateboarders to another. And the, mm. that particular one, it had the uh, small wheels and people used to wear baggy pants and the, the skateboard shape, it turned into, they call it a popsicle shape. It's just the nose and the tail kind of became kind of equal in terms mm. of its uh, length. Anyways, it was a big buzz and it was a huge cultural moment for skateboarding. And I was just at that exact moment. So like I was dyed in the wool skateboarding every single day, you know, it's just that's what we were doing. And that was great sense of community and also being outside. And then the third element. So we got the art, we got the skateboarding about reinterpreting the architecture. The third was um, music. And I was always deep into music. That was always a huge love and still is today. I got into, at one point, into like underground music and punk and hardcore and metal and all this stuff. And we used to go to shows um, and there were house shows and the whole network was kind of beautiful in the way it was. The one, they call it hardcore music, but uh, at the time, what it was was just underground music, you know, extreme music, whatever you want to call it. But it had this um, kind of intentionality as you were speaking about activism. And so it was like, women's rights, earth rights, animals mm. rights, you know, finding out who was the Zapatistas and, you know, School of the Americas. It was just like passing around all this information, basically saying the reality that you know is constructed and maybe it's not constructed that great. And as kids, we were like, wow, okay, we're on a mission here. And so the bands would write about it and then people would make fanzines about it, either personal ones about their own life or about the larger issues of society. And so... I got into protesting pretty hard and we would do that just basically in our social group that we'd go to all these music shows, we'd go skateboarding and then we'd be out in the street protesting whatever it may be. But um, yeah, I kind of hit a glass ceiling because I was like so into it. I was like, this is, we got to do all this stuff. People need us. We have the ability to do it. Let's try our best. And then, um, yeah, that whole standing on the side of the road with streets, you know, signs and people honking or yelling and then people mm -hmm. yelling back. I remember going, this is just not <laughs> the way. And so I kind of 
moved to Chicago for um, art school after. And I, I didn't want to tell anybody about that past I had. I, I wanted to try new things completely. But that activism thread was always grinding through my mind, even though I didn't have people to speak about it with. I was just kind of like, this is what it's all about. And I remember being at art school and um, one of my professors says, why does your art have to be about something? And I said, but isn't that what art's supposed to be to change the world? And he goes, no, sometimes it's just about stripes uh, next to each other on a painting. <laughs> and I remember being floored. I'm like, this guy doesn't know anything. Like, what? no, this is not what art is for. Art is yeah. literally to liberate us, to give us the do new perspective. And so I, I've always just had art like that, like, in my mind, I always, like when I grind through every single thought, I'm like, how do you make the biggest difference? For me, it came down to art. That's what touched me. Even in a small little town, I remember like, you know, there's not a lot of culture here, but it was MTV would have a music video. And I remember just seeing a little bit of whatever it may be at the time, Nirvana or, you know, some, some cool video. And I'm being like, uh, wow, you can do more than what people are doing in this town. None of the people in this town would do that. But I know you can do it now. And also the whole thing with we live next to the railroad tracks a few houses down. And mm -hmm. so that was the other form of art that came into my life was that all the kids spray painting in cities on the railroad track cars, they would come through. And I'd always think about that as like my art show, like this would come through and I would just look at all the different graffiti that was coming through my town. So those are like the two main threads of like contemporary art getting into the bloodstream here anyways long story short i just tried to combine all that stuff and then i was angry as a kid and more align myself with the punk and all that stuff but then there was a point where i started realizing strategies of how to deliver information mm. and i remember thinking like you know you have punk rock which is against the system at least this is a generalized <laughs> yeah. you know yeah. whatever you know molotov cocktails spray paint like hate the man whatever and i remember okay that's one way to go and then i saw this whole hippie thing uh you know these communes being built and people you know tearing apart cars and making houses and geodesic domes and and i thought okay that's also interesting because not only are you saying you know fuck the man with by getting out of the system but you're also creating something new so it's not just against something and i started getting kind of like thinking this is not good um just always be against the man like the man does one thing you, you know, it's man in quotes of course you know society or corporations or whatever they do something now there's a reaction against it i'm like you're kind of in this dance how do we switch over and just make something so cool and so new that everybody has to look at that and so that's where i kind of got into the whole strategy of like let's not be so easily read with mm. the anger let let's take it to this next level let's make it so intriguing so curious that people have to come into these ideas on their own volition so it wasn't like you do this i'm against you it's more like here's this and we speak about this you know vaishnavi and i uh the third space how do you create this other place where it's kind of like snaps that polarity apart and we all don't know how to deal with this, but that's interesting. I got to go over there. We see. And I think that's basically, if I boiled it all down, yeah, that's what it came to is just that I had easily acknowledged early on that we are much more than our roles that we play every day in our lives. You know, there's so much dimensionality in every human. But then how do you get that out? Because we're all in these rehearsed roles. And then I thought this, this idea of the spectacle or, or being able to pull people in through their curiosity into a new dialogue. So take an yeah. important idea, but then be able to deliver in a way that isn't just smack, smack, like against something, but actually this third space and we can go there and we can visit it. And there's no real problem here because it's not against me. It's just curious. Matthew, something you said struck a chord with me so deep because you said you were trying to find different mediums of different ways of delivering information. And up until you said that, when you typically think of art, you think of it as a visual medium that may or may not have any meaning in addition to what it visually represents. But I never thought about it as a vehicle to deliver information. And now when you've said that, like when you've articulated, I look back at all the projects we've done and it is about delivering a certain kind of information, you know, whether 
that is the state of affairs uh, in a small rural town, you know, reflecting everything that has happened as a result of different economic and political changes or whether it's creating this unfolding table where you serve food that is kind of bringing to light the information about what is dying in their immediate neighborhood. So in that sense, I think it's a very profound statement that you chose this as a way to to deliver information. But then I'm curious to know how you shifted mediums because because you started out with a with a spray can and everything we're doing right now is not <laughs> not something we do with a spray can in fact a lot of the stipulations we have for the public artworks uh, discourage people to use spray cans on you know the kind of stuff we build and when you talk about the third space we're literally talking about a space that we can engage with in in a more tangible way like it's not a digital space it's not a virtual space it's not a space that you experience through ar and vr you know it it exists in reality like it's it's built it's brick and mortar i'm curious to know where that shift happened because the way i think we identify ourselves is you know we we are a public art practice and we build public art projects, but we are not that far away from architecture. So we are also kind of, we're architects, but we are artists. And just looking at the nexus of sending kind of this information and the medium, what do you think? Yep. Um, there's a train going by in the background. Is is that okay? Or should we wait for a moment? Uh, this is the train actually that I, <laughs> this is the train <laughs> that, that carries the graffiti. That's how close it is. I don't know if you could hear that. <laughs> I okay, can. I think it's gone. Yeah, that's that. That was the uh, one of the. That was my curated shows. <laughs> come through. Um, let me just think. Um, so yeah, when I was um, okay, art as a kid, interesting. Wow, you can think, and and you know, art is confusing. What's good art? What's not? And you know, I'm I'm in a small town. There's a university here. And um, at one point, I would just go over to the library and get a whole bunch of art books. And uh, I'm not a night owl at all, but at that point in my life, I actually was. I, I would just get the books and put them down on this desk, and I would plow through them, and I would go into like 2 or 3 in the morning and be drawing and collaging and just trying to like, you know, have this dialogue between what I could consume in these books and then producing things. And that's basically what I used to get me into art school is just that portfolio. I didn't know it at the time. I was kind of more interested in living in a van and skateboarding and being out in the world. It was really kind of a lot of my family and girlfriend at the time pulling me back in saying, hey, where does this all end up? And they, they thought, okay, you know, maybe art school. And I just come off some big trips and I was like, okay, mm. yeah, maybe I'll try that. But when I got to art school, so I'm all loaded now with all these, you know, punk rock shows and skateboarding and hanging out with homeless people and living in a van. So I was kind of like, um, I was so supercharged to go to art school. So I get there and people start talking about art for the first time. And uh, there was a moment where I did think I was levitating. I thought my feet were not touching the ground hmm. um, because I was so happy. I was like, I can't believe people are interested in talking about this stuff. It was a, like a really profound moment for me. And I was like, wow. And I learned about critique. I'm like, you could critique anything. And like, how do we see these things? And I started to hone. So anyways, one of, I, I took every class. I took book binding. I took performance. I took video. I took, you know, mm. uh, the core stuff of drawing. I took um, installation. I just took as much as I could. But I got attracted to installation. I was like, okay, so you can make things in real life. At the same time, I was taking painting. And I remember this, just to speak about this transition, I was making paintings and the paintings started to gain more and more found materials. I would be always outside grabbing stuff and putting it in. But at one point, I started breaking the composition where it's not just about one painting, but two paintings next to each other that had a relationship. And then it started getting bigger and bigger where there was multiple paintings that had relationships, like one composition with multiple surfaces and then i just was like okay i think that the frame is constricting me and then yeah installation came in but i remember mm. being in that painting class and thinking um i said what's the best artwork you can make for painting like if you're in a gallery and then my idea was like 
just cut holes in the gallery so people can leave and go out into the world. And I was like, <laughs> so then I, I was like, I'm not interested in this gallery. I cannot be in here. I just can't. Yeah. Like where the people are, where the issues are, where it all happens is outside. And so I knew at that point, I want to make work for everyday people. I don't know how we're going to define that, but mm. I've actually kind of you might have seen my little Venn diagram. I kind of made, you know, wor work that's in public has to address these three for me, which is one is a uh, mass media. This is like people that view the world through like magazines and dentist office. You know, they're like mm -hmm. flipping through, you know, whatever TV show is hot or wherever the government is or where we are with climate change or what war we're in. Like just people know that and like on Jeopardy or whatever, you know. Current events. Yep. Yeah. Current events that people know. Then there's experiential. And these are people that are, aren't interested in that, but they're just like walking around the world. They're like making the, um, you know, the water come down their driveway. They're putting a rock here. It pushes it over here. Or they're trying to balance a stick on their hand or they've built something or, you know, they've explored the world for themselves one to one in a physical way. And then the other type of knowledge was academic. People that study movements or, you know, genres of art or, or any type of discipline. Mm. Those are three ways of perceiving the world. And I thought, how do you make a work that can touch all those different, or be interesting to all those different ways, those three ways of looking? So that was always a criteria I had. Is this impressive for someone who studies whatever? The larger, um, you know, scope of architecture or art. Can they see this as, as someone's pushing the envelope? Then we push over into the mass media. Can someone who just cares about, you know, the world around them through this mediated, um, experience of of corporation you know corporate media and whatever can they read this and then someone who just sees the world just walks around are they impressed enough to go damn i want to look at that more so those that was my criteria of um of making things and when we look at your work right now again i'm still drawn to when you're talking about representing information a lot of it whether it's talking about you know, these three points and finding something at the intersection of all those three or your larger intention to, you know, create a work that is also symbolic of what you think it stands for. But this very inherently reflects in your method or your process of doing something. And I mean, I know firsthand that you actually do collect a lot of information. Research is a huge part of the studio. I mean, not just like historical archival research, but research also that you do on the ground with the communities that you are designing for. And so I'm hinting towards the outdoor living room, something that has become this iconic charade almost that you, that you do in the middle of a town square, you know, where you just put sofas out, warm cookies, milk, coffee, and just invite the community to be a part of this conversation. Almost the way I think about it is in a lot of ways, when you're talking about the gallery and cutting holes so that people could go out in the real world, you think of art and high art as something that is just so exclusive. You need to have a certain whatever trained eye to appreciate a Rothko, for example. If it were just hanging on a billboard, you'd probably not even see it. But just because in a gallery and it's framed in a certain way it has a certain value but the way your process thinks about art very broadly is it tries to almost democratize the final installation or the final product it's almost like making art more accessible or making design more accessible and so I wanted you to talk a little bit about the outdoor living room but I also really wanted to know how you started it because I know there's a method to the madness it's not just like putting in sofas and you know come chat about your town but how did you come up with it how did you devise it yes yes I'll tell you both Let, let's make sure I don't lose them because I got two different threads one is kind of about sensitivity and the other one is how it all started and it actually started in Chicago but I'll start with the sensitivity part so you know as a person in the world as we all are we are living, we're having our experiences. Some are good, some are pleasant, some are not. Sometimes we try things, they work out. Sometimes we have desires unmet. You know, just as a person in the world, one of the things I kept on noticing was um, how sensitive someone was. And, you know, some people are very, very sensitive and like brash and hard context would be too much and they might 
retreat back and then someone that might be so rough and tumble that they can't deal with something so sensitive it, it drives them mad or whatever. And so I always just thought about like, you know, if you took a hammer to tune a piano, you'd probably damage the piano. And then if you took an instrument that might tune a piano and you try to put in a nail, you might damage the instrument. And so one of the things for me is like, and it's always a wish I've had is like, you know, to figure out your own sensitivity. Where are you on the scale? And they complement your surroundings or have your, your surroundings complement it and, you know, by your own will, if you can. And so the way I just describe it is like on a construction site, it might be great that people are covered, you know, in dirt mm. and putting things together, this camaraderie, and it's all of this nice nature. And there's whatever it may be, this real fun uh, energy. But then, like, you think about, and, and you can't be rough enough. He's like, oh, this guy's so great. He does this. Or this woman, you know, she can eat nails, you know. But then there's another one where, um, you know, people take their shower. They have their meal. They get all dressed up, and they go to a concert hall. And in that concert hall might be the pianist. Mm. And um, at that point, you know, they introduce who's coming out to play. And everybody, there's a hush over the room. And then all of a sudden the player comes in and this becomes very quiet. They open the, you know, the lid and they start to stroke the keys. And at that moment, I mean, everybody is just waiting to hear how this is done, how sensitive they are. And at that moment, that piano player can't be sensitive enough. You know, it's almost like we've, we, we want out of them to be the ultimate sensitive. And so what I've looked at in the world is just like, figure out where you are on the scale and try to find somewhere mm. that uh that you can fit in so you're you're not going up against the wrong kind of energy you know um and and making your world harder than it is so i'm always hoping that people can find that anyways that that story all goes into the fact that i have just so many times i've been in situations where i'm like the format of this is not good mm. like either it's the work culture or whatever but one of the things i didn't like was these um city hall meetings like i always felt they were kind of you know, maybe the louder people in the room or the people that felt like their ideas were more in line with the agenda or even how the agenda was set. I'm like, this is not working for everyone. I can clearly see there's a lot of voices that are not speaking out because you'd have conversations with people, you go into a city hall meeting and they would stick to a certain agenda. I'm like, okay, this is not about information gathering. Mm. This is about uh, solidifying certain themes. And so I wanted to step out of that. I knew that each community has way more knowledge to it and a lot of the projects are about that. It's creating a framework so this kind of knowledge can come out. But in particular, talk about this outdoor living room. That's what it was all about. Is like, how do you take the meeting? How do you extract, you know, information from a community, but don't go through these normal channels of city hall meeting, got to be here by eight. Here's the agenda. We're going to get through these. Anybody have questions kind of thing. What I did was um, we put living room furniture in a public space could be street and be in front of a grocery store, whatever it may be. And it's for people passing by to go, what the hell is that? And then mm. I said, oh, come on over. And we're just talking about the town here. Have a coffee. They're like, well, I don't know much about town. I said, no, no problem here. Everybody, these are really easy questions we're just talking about. And people would sit down and go, okay, this is interesting. What's this? You know, and I would ask questions and I, I call them all softball questions. Like, what is, uh, what's the history or the unknown history of this town? What is something that is not known for me just visiting, but something that you guys have. And someone would be like, well, that building there used to be a creamery. I said, what, mm. what's that all about? And they said, well, we used to have, you know, an ice cream store here and, uh, you know, it was connected to a farm out of town, but then it went under and they turned to a radio station. I said, so it became a radio station. Yeah, but before that, we used to have chickens inside of it or whatever it may be, you know. And you're like, okay, that's interesting. They said, yeah, that was next to the tobacco shop that my grandfather had and actually in the back of that. And you start to hear all these stories. There's a number of questions, like 10 questions we ask, but you really extract a different type of knowledge out of this situation. And we get into contentious, like what is working really well in this town? Where do we see people coming together in great ways beyond the 4th of July parades or beyond the typical holidays? And then we go into the negative. Where does this town fail? What are issues that just have not been addressed? And so we kind of cruise through all these things. And I even get to a point where I'm like, what's a secret that only you know about this town? Like maybe you feel there's a magic parking spot. So every time you pull in to where you want to go, there's always a certain parking spot waiting for you or you like the way a shadow falls on a building when you eat your lunch 
or whatever it may be, or, mm. you know, there's hawks in your chimney, just something that only you know. And so I take all that information. Of course, I meet with the mayor and the organizers and the community as well, one-on-ones to gather all. But that outdoor living room is where you get a lot of this really authentic um, sentiment. And what we're searching for with all the works, how do you get to something that this community or the local government has not addressed yet? And this is, I found it to be the most potent way to get those answers. There's no agenda. It's open form. I'm a person that doesn't know anything. I just have an open notebook. And so I just take it all in and start to like triangulate. I'm like, wow, a number of people have said this. And then I'll bring it to, yeah, the city government. Are you, are you guys addressing this or a community leader group? And we'll try to figure out. And once we find something that no one is really addressing, we take that as the focus of the work. Anyways, long story short. And then the way it all started with the outdoor living room was that when I was in Chicago, I had a van. This was the van I spoke about living in. Mm. In art school, I had a nice group of friends. You know, all these wild characters were all meeting. We're making music together, speaking philosophy and theory and whatever we could just about life. We're all meeting a bunch of like, whatever, you know, misfits. But then we're all at this art school. So it's like, damn, this is really cool. They, they want this from us and we're going for it. So we would drive around in the van around different neighborhoods in Chicago and everybody's throwing out whatever, you know. So we go to a wealthy neighborhood and they'd be throwing out like a fake plant and a pretty awesome <laughs> lamp or whatever. We go to another neighborhood and there'd be, you know, whatever, a vacuum thrown out. Yeah. We would collect it all and then we would just bring it to a park and we'd set it up as a outdoor living room but we just did it just because it's like something to do as we're mm. having all these ramblings because i had a there was two captain chairs in the van and the whole rest i had taken out because i had a bed back there so it was just all these people in there we were listening to music and just chatting crazy uh, yeah it was very nice um but it ended up with these outdoor living rooms and so long story short i had that in my past as something that was cool we actually slept in the buildings that night and in the morning, we saw all these tourists looking at it like, oh, is this, what kind of <laughs> art is this? So I knew it had some value. I got invited to do a project in, in uh, York, Alabama. And they asked me, they said, would you come down and speak with the community? I said, yeah, do you want me to give a talk? And they said, no, we want you to hang out with them. And, um, you know, on a different plane. I was like, okay, that's cool. I said, what about like, we all get together and we go for a bike ride? And they said, well, in this community, no one really rides bikes. I was like, okay, mm. what can we do? And so that's when I started thinking, you know what? Let's do an outdoor living room and just have a chat. So we just took one of the main streets. We put um, this outdoor living room. We actually asked people at that point to bring furniture. And so everybody brought a little bit. And then we just sat down and had a chat. And that was, that was the initial one. And I've refined it from there. I saw the magic that I actually could ask questions that were outside you know, the lines of any city meeting and mm. get real answers. And I was like, okay, this is actually really good to do because maybe these are not the same characters that show up at the city hall and we're not talking about anything that's on those agendas, yet we are still a community speaking about our community. So I, that's where I started realizing, okay, this is, this is powerful. And yeah, just refine it. And now it's one of the dominant ways we get information from a community uh, coming in as an outsider to get people to actually speak about it in real terms, what the issues are. I had no idea that's how it began, but I'm so glad it did. And so for everybody who's listening, if you want to learn more about Matthew's outdoor living rooms and want to see some really cool images of them, head over and see Matthew's TED Talk that went live last week. And it's been an absolute honor to have worked with you on that. But with all the current projects in the pipeline, where do you see yourself in the next five or 10 years? What's next for you? <laughs> That's a good question. Huh? Uh, and Vaishnavi, thank you so much for working on that TED Talk with me. That was a, uh, yeah, it's hard to be that self-reflective when they say, hey, you know, let's put together a talk about your practice. It's because uh, you're so deep in. So that was a pleasure working with you on that one. Oh, uh, five to 10 years. That's a, yeah, that's the kind of question they ask you. Uh, people ask you all the time. <laughs> Sorry to have caught you off guard. No, no, it, uh, it makes you think a lot. Um, you know, one of the things that I was interested in, and it kind of goes back to the beginning, is like once I found out that there is much more to every person than it seems. You know, this was like an early thought. I'm like, huh, you know, people might be acting a certain way or 
presenting themselves almost as locked into a certain ego or, or, or posturing or whatever. But I remember like seeing like, let's, let's take an easy example. Like say we're all walking down the street. We all know we don't talk to our neighbors. You can give a little hi or whatever, but you know, there's not a lot of conversation, but like, let's say, um, a paint truck comes around the corner carrying all this paint and it and it ends up having an accident and paint goes all over the street and it starts to go down the street you'll actually have people for a moment go oh my god look at that or like they'll stop and they'll be part of a situation and i remember going huh the social fabric was just ripped open people mm. are willing to talk to each other at this one moment this small accident because it maybe it had some something interesting with the paint colors or however it was working allowed people to speak and maybe even speak about things that they would not have thought that they had inside of themselves like wow you know i i that's almost like a rainbow do you know about whatever and it's like so two people are talking in a unique new way and so i just kind of focused on that i'm like well how do we get how do we cultivate that moment more and more and so i guess there's like a deep desire from me to see that more and more for people to make conditions that we can become, I don't know, bigger, I don't know what the word is, but to go deeper inside of ourselves or to have more of ourselves expressed to each other, to show more of our humanity than, you know, the day-to-day -day status quo lives allow us to have. And so that's that's just always been the magic of it all. I, as you spoke about art and architecture, for me, architecture, even though I'm not an architect, I've always, the power of the built environment is so strong for me. Like, how a building looks, how it, it how it feels open, who's it for, all these things can shape, you know, do I feel welcome to go inside? Do I feel mm -hmm. not? Hey, this park feels safe. This street feels not safe. Um, hey, what are these people doing? Wow, this is a really neat environment, whatever. I just started noticing how much the built environment can play in shaping our relationships, how we feel about ourselves, conversations. And so that's where I tapped into it. So, so much stuff is on this architectural scale or using architectural uh, methods or, or thoughts. Um, so if we talk about five to 10 years, like the thing that I've always wanted and always liked is almost on the scale of planning. Like yeah, how, yeah. Do you, how, do you, how do you make places that allow us to be to show more of ourselves, not to be more isolated or, or more rehearsed, you know, but can actually provoke us to show more of ourselves to each other in this hopes that, you know, there's much salvation in that connection between us all. I, it might seem hippie or whatever, but I think for me, that might be the hope of it all is that, you know, we are together. We do all love each other. The fact that we coexist, I know some people might have different viewpoints on that, mm. but, um, the amount of cooperation that humans have is quite, you know, if you actually look at it, like even the fact that you're in Omnibod right now and I'm in Canton, we're doing this whole thing. I mean, it's amazing yeah. how it's all set up, you know, it's, it's, it's way beyond us. What's, what's going on from the technology to the theories to, you know, yeah. the experience. It's just, it's radical if you ever sat down and thought about it. But yeah, that's what I always think about is, um, how do we twist all this stuff up so we can maximize these experiences so that really we get to see the best of each other well that's a very good note to end this on but if i were to tell you just like one thing i think we should have these conversations more often because now <laughs> yes. i'm just like left so pensive and i'm thinking about where i lie on the spectrum and where do i fit in am i the nail or the piano and i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome but hey, Matthew, thank you so much, so much for doing this. I mean, this is literally like, I wouldn't even say cherry on top of the cake. This is like an entire cake on top of a cake. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so nice much. Image. Yes, of course, Vaishnavi. Hey, thank you for inviting me. Special thanks to Kahan Shah for the background score. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Architecture Off Center on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes are released every two weeks. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Arc Off Center. That is A R C H O F F C E N T R E. Thanks for listening.